All right, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the meeting. I want to believe everybody can hear me. Please, if, if you can hear me, just um, let me have um, like I put an emoji in the chat box. Let me know if people can hear me. Good morning, everybody. If you can hear me right now, just put something in the chat box. Let me know if you can hear me. Use an emoji to indicate that you can hear me loud and clear. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Pamela. I see you. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm expecting one or two more people to help me with an emoji so I know that you can hear me loud and clear, and then we can roll up. Oh, thank you, Jennifer. Okay, I see you. Okay, thank you. Okay, Hannah, thank you so much. All right, it's beautiful, which means everybody can can hear me pretty well. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. So, all right, so without any further ado, we get started with the meeting very, very quickly, and so we don't um, waste them. Um, anybody's time. All right, so once again, welcome everybody. I am Shomi, I am Olu Shomi Odugua. I am the Communications um, Officer for South Saharan Social Development Organization, and I will be the moderator for today's um, webinar. And of course, um, some of us will have an idea of what um, today's meeting is all about and what we want to learn and achieve. And of course, of course, as a way of introduction and giving a kind of small rundown, today we want to look at um, key things around tax audits and compliance. Of course, I know some of us are in the NGO space or in the NGO sector, and of course, if you're not directly in the NGO space or in the NGO sector, of course, some of the things you learn today also come in very handy for your businesses. We look at some things around tax audits, tax management, compliance issues, and of course, how this can help us manage or structure our business and our organizations better to function more effectively. So that's part of what we'll be looking at today in today's meeting. And once again, everybody is welcome. Again, I say welcome, 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 everybody. I'm excited about this. This is a, a, a nice initiative that we're having and putting together. And I want to believe that we're going to, we're going to make the most of um, today's meeting. All right, like I mentioned before, I work with South Saharan Social Development Organization. We are the hosts organizing and putting this event together. South Saharan is a non-profit organization that um, works with women, youth, and children, leveraging education and good governance as vehicles to help make development and change happen in the community around us that we find ourselves in. And so this is what we do. Our strategic objective is to, of course, um, leverage or intervene with cross in cross-cutting governance issues like um, health, climate change, you know, and of course, one key thing that we're doing here today, of course, is um, understanding how better, how well to work with a uh, key stakeholder that we, work, that we work with, which is the government. So it is important that in everything we do, of course, as a business owner, somebody in the NGO space, you have to understand how to work, work effectively with the government. Looking at it from today's angle is what we'll be considering from tax and compliance. All right. So and once again, thank you for joining us today. And that's part of what we're going to be doing very quickly. And of course, and we have two sections, we have two speakers, and we have two guests that will be running us through to this same section. Our first speaker is um, Mr. Seneke Justin from um, Caritas Nigeria, is um, the Caritas Nigeria um, Finance Manager for Emo State. You are most welcome, Mr. Seneke Justin. It's, it's a pleasure to have you join us today for today's conversation, and we, we can't wait to learn a whole lot from you And as you take us through issues around tax and compliance in Nigeria today. Our second speaker will be um, Amaka Okoye, that's the SSDO's finance manager. And also, um, Amaka, we are glad, it's a pleasure to also have you. These are two very, very experienced people in the finance space. And of course, trust me, I say I'm going to be learning a whole lot from them as regards tax finance issues in Nigeria, with Nigeria as a context, as a case study. So yes, that's, those, those are our guests that will be working us through today's um, conversation. And also, I also want to also, also hint, of course, after the, the, the speakers, we'd like our speakers to speak first, then as, as they speak, I'm sure some of you might have some questions that you want to clarify. Please just take note of your questions. Of course, you can jot them down, or if you have them in real time, you can also help me put it in the chat. And of course, I will collate and keep them together. Then when both speakers are done speaking, I'll take um, our questions. So if, uh, as the speakers are, are, are speaking, if you have any question, kindly put it in the in the chat box, put it in the chat section for me so I can call it. And then when our speakers are both done, they would come through the, 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 the questions. So very quickly, let me quickly introduce, give a brief about our first speaker before he gets into, into his um, speech. All right, so Mr. Seneke, just like I said, um, is the finance manager for Caritas Nigeria, Emo State. The, it, he has vast experience as he regards um, grants and compliance issues, a grant and compliance specialist with over 11 years of working experience and, of course, tangible workings to show for this 
in the financial management space as regards grants management, auditing, budgeting, and taxation. He's also a member of the Chartered Institute of Taxation of Nigeria, CITN, and is also a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Forensics and Certified Fraud Investigation of Nigeria, CIF, CIFIN. And also, of course, is a PhD student currently working on his pro project, which is um, researching the determinants and consequences of sustainability for NGOs. So yes, this is our very first speaker. Of course, I told you there's a whole lot to look forward. And this person we have here is a really grounded person that's going to walk us through regulations on tax and compliance in Nigeria. So Mr. Justin, Mr. Justin please, and you have the floor. Thank you so much. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Yes, yes, Mr. Justin. Yes, we can hear you. Good morning. Good morning. I can you see my slide? Yes, yes, we can. Yes. Okay. All right, so uh, good morning once again. Uh, I'm sure everyone can hear me because the moderator has done a good job. We have confirmed that we can hear ourselves, so I think that's great. Mr. Moderator, can I go on? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please go on. Okay. So, thank you very much. So, I am going to talk to you today on the regulations of tax and compliance in Nigeria. We're looking at the non-governmental organization perspective. So everything we're going to talk today, we'll have to narrow it down to what happened in the NGO sector. So looking at the overview of tax laws in Nigeria, uh, there are actually some laws, some acts that govern the payment regulations of tax in Nigeria. So some of these laws, but these laws that we use in Nigeria are captioned here. We have the Personal Income Tax Act, Company Income Tax Act, Finance Act, the Value Added Tax Act, Stamp Duties, Ground Profit Tax Act, Capital Gain Tax, Taxes and Babies. This is approved lease for collection. Then we have the Education Tax Act as amended. Then the Federal Land Revenue Service Act. So uh, we have the Companies and Income Tax Act. Oh, no, okay. So these are the acts that we, we talked about in uh, Nigeria. So to narrow it down to the NGO sectors, there are four tax laws that, are, that concerns us in the NGO sector. And these are the Company Income Tax Act, Personal Income Tax, Value Added Tax, Tax and Davis. All the other mentioned ones that I mentioned earlier, a lot of them are what we use in this country. But for us here in Nigeria, this is what governs the NGO setting. This does not mean that this is the end. At, at different times, when different government comes, new reforms are always introduced. So if another reform comes any other day that tries to change us or add another, uh, uh, act here or reduce anyone who will still go with it. But in the current world today, in the current Nigerian context today, these are the four laws that govern or that we use for tax in the NGO setting. So tax administration in Nigeria, there are three bodies that administer taxation in Nigeria. The Federal Board of Final Revenue, Administer personal income, uh, administers uh, personal tax of residents of the federal capital territory and company income tax. And this is done through the Federal Land Revenue Service, FIRS. Then the State Internal Revenue Board, which administers individuals and personal income tax, some withholding tax, and they, they do this through the State Internal Revenue Service. Of course, you should know that. Every state of the Federation of Nigeria has its own state internal revenue service. And so they have their different names uh, uh, given to it as stipulated in their laws. But the law in Nigeria allows that every state in Nigeria have this. And this body 
is governed by the joint tax board. Of course, they have a meeting, they have where they are regulated. They are not just allowed to operate in the air. So they are regulated. And then the body that regulates them is the joint tax board. Then the local government revenue authorities that administer charges, levies in their respective jurisdictions. So these are the three tiers, and these are all the three bodies that manage the taxation in Nigeria. Tax paid by NGOs. We have very few tax that we pay in the NGO world. We have the pay as you earn, pay, the withholding tax on goods and services. Of course, they could, if you have at any means to do any form of contract, then withholding tax will also come in here too. They will have local taxes and fees, such as parking or garbage collection levies. Every state or different region had this too, so they try to give it a nomenclature that fits what they think in their state. But the whole thing here is there are these collection fees that uh, the state of the federation collects. And so as NGOs, we are bound to pay this in uh, to the government where we exist or work. Income tax on passive income, such as individuals, rent, royalties, interest, investment income, it is it. So if you could make any passive income, then you do this, you pay this tax. Of course, we know that NGO is a, uh, they are not profit oriented. We are aware of this. The law is aware of this. But if, if at any means during your operation, you have to make some passive income, some income, then you may pay tax for these things. If you are paying rent, you have to pay tax, royalties, interest, and all that. If you are going to make any interest from the business or your operations, you will have to pay tax on it. And lastly, we have the capital gain tax. And this one, happens if we dispose assets. So if at any point the NGO decide to sell off their assets, maybe you have cars that you use for so many years or furnitures or the likes, and you try to sell them off, you dispose them and you make profit on this disposition, then you will have to pay tax to the government. So by and large, these are the five taxes that are commonly associated with the NGO setting in Nigeria. Recall that I have mentioned at the point that uh, this is this may not be exhaustive, not exhaustive in the sense that if other government comes up and change the tax laws in Nigeria, because we may have more to pay or less. So there is flexibility at this level because it can change. But for now, this is what we have. Remember, the topic has to do with something of compliance. So I am emphasizing on this because. We have to do the right thing. We have to comply to the laws of the, the land. And then what do we do so that we'll be free from harassment or we'll be a people that does what the government wants us to do, the government that will work in their own area. So type of taxes in Nigeria. Again, uh, these taxes are not all that we pay. These are taxes that you find in the Nigerian tax system. Like I mentioned, this is when the NGO does not pay all this. But it's important that we know, or there is a mention that these taxes exist. So first here is the company income tax. This is paid by all companies in Nigeria. Before now, it used to be 30% of your profit. But we know in recent reforms, there have been some adjustment about this tax. So currently companies with annual turnover Less than 25 million are expected uh, are exempted from paying these taxes. Companies with annual turnover between 25 and 100 million. Why is over 100 million? So if you don't know, you need to know this because before now it was 30% flat. But now the new laws have changed this. So we have to know the dynamics that, uh, that, uh, that have accompanied the company income tax law in Nigeria. And the Federal, Federal Land Revenue Service, FIRS, 
is the government agency in charge of the collection and administration of company income tax in Nigeria. The value added tax is also known as a consumption tax, as it covers specific goods and services that are often used by final consumers for whom tax is charged. The rate at the moment is 7.5%. Part is regulated by virtue or the virtue of the Value Added Tax Act. So we also have the stamp duties. Stamp duties is the tax on duty payable on any agreement executed in Nigeria, especially in respect of any property situated in any state in Nigeria. It is also imposed at the rate of 7.5%, 0.75% on the authorized share capital the incorporation of a company or increase of share or, or of share capital. Stamp duty is chargeable either at the fixed rate or at value rate. In line with the recent amendment from Stamp Duty Act, all financial institutions in Nigeria are required to charge stamp duties at 15 naira on every eligible transaction above 10,000. So of course, this is why we see a lot of the charges uh, on our accounts we do transfer or receive income. These are new reforms that are accompanying our tax laws in Nigeria. Of course, it is governed by the virtual of Stamp Duty Act. Education tax. So this one is charged at the rate of 2%. is imposed on accessible profit of all companies to found the Teacher Education Trust Fund. The amount generated from education tax contributes to the funding of universities, polytechnics, and colleges of education in Nigeria. So we have a capital gain tax it's imposed on the disposition of chargeable assets, whether by sale or exchange, at a rate of 10%. And again, we have the Petroleum Profit Tax, which rates ranges between 50% to 85%. The tax is imposed upon the chargeable profit of the companies operating in the upstream petroleum sector. And then companies charged under this tax are exempted from the company's income tax. So the clear thing here is those companies that fall under petroleum profit tax are exempted from paying tax under the company income tax at which we have discussed earlier. The tax is regulated by the virtual of the Federal Tax Act. Then the personal income tax, this is paid by individual or individuals to various states they reside. It's important that you know this paid by individuals to the various states where they reside. You can reside in a new group and be paying your tax, your personal income tax to the government of let's say Anambra or any other state. So that's what the law imposes here. And it is imposed on the incomes or profit of individual group of people that could be families or non others. Personal income tax is administered by the relevant state government through their various internal revenue service or internal revenue agency. The PE that will deduct from our payrolls this is where it is handled. And this tax is one of the tax that so much affects the NGO. And when you don't do it, this is where the authorities will come after you. It's important that we understand this, important that we see that we put it into practice. Personal income tax is regulated by the Personal Income Tax Act. So these are the rates. These are the rates for personal income tax. And these are the rates that's expected that we use to charge our PE on our payroll. So personal income tax, say from zero naira to 300,000, you have a progressive rate of 7%. Then the next 300,000 will be 11%, the next 500,000, 15, and then the next 19, 21, and above 3.5%. 2 million 24 percent. Of course, uh, we, we don't have time to see who we'll bring in the task calculator here to do this, but that could be on another forum. 
however it's good that you know this rate and please let's try to get to the current rate because taxes and laws changes in the recent time the government is still running on reforms in the tax system in nigeria so we have not had uh, recent reforms here but we know that they may come so we have to watch out so that they come when it's due we implement so that employees who earn not more than the national minimum wage of 30,000 and no longer liable to tax for deduction of the monthly pay. Somebody will say, why are you talking about 30,000 Naira here? This is the last time, as at the last salary minimum wage, this is where we were. We, we, we all of us know that it's recently, just this week, that the president signed into law the new minimum wage. So that new minimum wage will come into effect after a while, but for now, that you and I know this portion of the law has not been amended. But from what we are seeing, there is a window that this will soon be amended because the minimum wage has changed. But this is what we're working with, and this is how the laws read. So after signing into law, it will take a time. The government will definitely give us a time to start implementing. So we'll look into it. So that has not been done. So now we're still talking about 30,000 Naira as the minimum wage in Nigeria. As far as taxation of PD is concerned. So where a tax payer has no taxable income because of personal relief and allowance or total income produce a tax lower than the minimum tax, the minimum tax rate of 1% of the total income is payable. What are we saying here? Sometimes there are allowances, there are relief. People may go into life, uh, life assurance, and other relief allowed by law. So by the time you compute that relief, you will see that they may not have any tax to pay. They may have nothing to pay. But because our tax system wants everybody to pay tax, this issue of minimum tax is not comes. And that's why they're saying, if you find a person like this, there should be a minimum tax rate of 1% of the total income is paid. So what your total income Put your total income together, the law will charge one percent of that and you will pay. That's when you have done everything under the law to see that you are you are not paying tax. Maybe you have all those uh, tax relief, and then after putting them together, you see that you have nothing to pay. But if you get to that level, you will still pay one percent. And maybe people that after working all their tax, they have nothing to pay. This one is now relief. Maybe on the normal note. If you have nothing to pay, the law still says that you should pay 1%. You shouldn't just go free like that. This implies that on our payroll, everybody on our payroll will have to pay tax. Once the person is on the payroll, when you walk the tax and you see this, then that means you have to charge 1%. That's if the person is so low, I cannot pay anything. That is the implication here. And it's very important that we note this. These are areas where uh, the tax authorities check or put on their touchlight when they come for tax audit and therefore finding us wanted. Withholding tax is another tax that is paid by the NGO. Uh, it is an advanced income tax payment. It is intended to bring taxpayers into the tax debt. People will be running away from tax. People have their way to maybe at the end of the year, they will, they will, they will, they will have a way to work uh, their books of account so that you won't see their profit, you won't see what they earn in the year, and therefore they do not have tax to pay. So the government produced this tax and is thinking, the thought here is that as they are doing business with you, you will have to deduct their tax right from when you are paying them money and pay in advance as withholding tax. So that by the time you come at the end of the year running or trying to be smart, Saying you don't have, you don't, you, 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 you have made no profit, you have nothing to pay. Already your withholding tax has gone. So it was introduced to cop tax inversion, allowing payment to be deducted as source and remitted to the appropriate tax authority. It's governed by both the Companies Income Tax Act and Personal Income Tax Act. Withholding tax rates are displayed somewhere below. So, the amount deducted as source is required to be remitted in, in the case of amount due to the Federal Land Revenue Service not later than 21st day 
of the month following the month of the payment. And the relevant state internal revenue service no later than 30 days, 30th day of the month following the month of payment. What they are saying here is if you deduct tax, we don't need tax from what somebody, from a supplier, a contractor that pays or supplies to you in your NGO, then pay back, pay that money that you deducted to Federal Inland Revenue at least on, on the 21st day of the next month. Don't allow it to cross. If you allow it to cross, you are liable to pay penalty. You pay to the state at least on the 30th day of the next month. This implies that for every month as NGOs, you have to look through your books. Is there any deduction of withholding tax? If there is, you have to remove it. But when the tax authority comes, they will see this as a loophole and then they will deal with you. So this is what we need to know and it's very important. These are the rates. These are the new rates. You recall that there is an adjustment or amendment to this law. Before now, this was not what it were. But on the 1st of July this month, 1st of July in this year 2024, the federal government adjusted through the Minister of Finance, the Honorable Minister made this pronouncement. And then uh, these are the rates that we have currently. These are the current rates. So if you don't have it, please you have to go look for it. Uh, we can also share so that let's do the right thing. So anything you are doing as from June, July 1st of 2024, that does not agree with this, you may be wrong and the tax authority may come after you. So the dividends and interest rate is at 10%. Uh, for residents and non resident In the previous law, in the previous uh, withholding tax law, some portions of the law were silent about resident and non resident. But in the current one now, they are open. They are, they, they, the law has spelled out clean about resident and non resident. If you look at the other table before now, the table that we use in withholding tax, then it will be talking about companies and individuals. That was the emphasis of the law then. But this current one now is talking about resident and non resident. So we have to look at this. So there are, these are the rates. Then we can't go through all of them. So, but this is what is here. Then we have exemption of withholding tax. Again, there's a lot of uh, difference here from what we used to have before, what we have coming up 1st of July. So this is what to have. So exemption of company categorized as small company. So they say whose turnover is uh, 25 million and less based on section 105 of Company Income Tax Act from requirement to deduct tax at source. Any transaction provided that the supplier has a valid tax, and tax identification number that is thin. The value of transaction is 2 million or less during the relevant calendar month. So in essence, in essence, where you where your the, your the contractor or the supplier is a small business that has less than 25 million turnover, 25 million and below turnover. And this person has tax. This person has thing. Then such a person we you will not deduct withholding tax from it. Uh, tax expert has studied this exemption, and then there are arguments. But this is what we have for now. Let's not go into those arguments. But this is it. You know, this law is new. This law is just 30 days old today. And uh, so people are still interpreting it. And uh, that, but that's what we have. That's what we know for now. I just try to present it the way it is, the way it came out from the minister's presentation, so that there won't be so much ambiguity and then confusion. So, uh, across the counter transaction, are also exempted from withholding tax. Goods manufacture or manufacture or material produced by the persons by the person making the supply are also exempted. Uh, when let's say we have local goods that are produced here, uh, 
uh, it's local people that produce uh, maybe shoes, other things, other local things are produced in Nigeria. Uh, the law wants to see that such persons are exempted from this tax so that uh, they will have a relief boost their business. That's my interpretation of this. The important goes where the transaction does not create a taxable presence in Nigeria for the foreign supplier. So any payment in respect of income, profit, is exempted from tax. The withholding tax exemption continues out of pocket expenses. If you do out of pocket ex expenses, they are supposed to be with, with the, the, they are supposed to be exempted from withholding tax. The insurance premium are also exempted. Supply of liquid uh, petroleum gas (LPG), compressed natural gas (CNG), petroleum motor spirits (PMS), the normal petrol we know, fuel, the automotive gas oil (AGO). As the gas we know, the low phosphor oil, PO, then the kerosene that we know, and then check add one. All these supplies are supposed to be exempted from the tax. This is to see that uh, they reduce the, the cost, they reduce the end cost to the to the to the beneficiary. Let's hope that the company and petroleum tax act will be amended to cover this but for, for us here this is what we see and this is what was presented by the minister so we have to take it the way it is commission returned by a broker from what is collected on behalf of the principal in line with the industry norms for such transaction winnings from a game of chance reality show the content designed exclusively to promote entrepreneurship academic technologies and scientific innovations these are also exempted from withholding tax. Apart from all other above, there are other taxes and levies imposed on companies operating in Nigeria. Some of these levies include uh, industrial training fund levy, which represents 1% of the payroll in companies having more than five employees or more than 50 million turnover. National Social Insurance Trust Fund levy, which also is 1% of the payroll in all companies operating in Nigeria. That's compliance in Nigeria. So, uh, tax compliance refers to adhering to tax laws regulations by correctly reporting income, expenses, and other financial details to the relevant tax authority. Within three months, so here we are trying to look at what makes up compliance. What do you do? What are you supposed to do? mix up compliance. What do we look out for as non-governmental organization, as NGO, to see we are complying? What do we do so that when uh, authorities come to public us to look into our booths, they will not find us? That's what this slide is trying to talk about. And then first here, the second bullet point here was that within three months of every year, every taxable entity is obliged to prepare and then that self-assessment tax returns, including the amount of tax payable, variety, joint entity is resident. Uh, within three months of every year, we need to do this. The filing of annual return at specific dates as stipulated by State Internal Revenue Service. That first January is for some state. You are expected that on the 31st day of January, of the new year, you should fight in return for what you have done in the previous year. A lot of NGOs have been found wanting, wanting here. People with deduct withholding taxes, people with deduct uh, pay, and pay these monies actually. They will pay the monies, they will remit the monies to the government. But at the end of the year now, by the time you cross into the new year, they will forget to file annual returns. And especially when people are not reminded, when NGOs are not reminded, they forget to file annual returns. By the time the law, the tax audit comes, they will find you wanting. States may have different dates. But for, the, for a lot of states, for a lot of states, where some, 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 some states have it up to February and some to go into, into March. So the what? We are trying to advise here is that at the beginning of every year, after you have deducted and paid all that you need to pay for in the previous year, when you cross into a new year, file your annual return. Put it together. 
every state have specifications on what they want to they want you to file as annual return so when you don't understand ask your state internal revenue service board now how does it look like what are the requirements for this filing they will give you if you put it together and file i am emphasizing here because a lot of NGOs have been found wanting here. It may not take anything to file because you don't do it. People or taxation in Nigeria and across the world is governed by laws, regulation. That's why this presentation is talking about regulation and compliance. So if you comply and you did not follow the regulation, then you have not completed the process. So we need to complete this process so that it will not be found wanting. It is not worth it to state that payment of taxes is a duty of all Nigerians' residents, as well as companies and NGOs incorporated in Nigeria. NGOs must deduct the e tax from employee salary and withholding tax. Consultancy is rent and services awarded to individuals, contractors, suppliers to remit to the State Board of Internal Revenue. You must deduct. Because when audit comes, they will ask for your payroll. They will ask for other vital information in your organization. And from there, if you're not careful, they will be able to deduce and see that you have paid this tax, you have paid the other one, and you have not paid this. Or you decided to exempt some people on the payroll from payment of pay. So they have a way of looking at this. So you therefore, have to be careful and see that everybody on your payroll have to go on the schedule of uh, on that schedule of uh, of remittance to your internal state to your state board of internal revenue. Of course, I had mentioned at the point that there is minimum tax, so there is nobody that you see is totally exempted from payment of pay. So if the person money is not enough, there is a minimum tax of one percent, which we have talked about earlier. These deductions are remitted where the employees reside or from where contractors and suppliers operate along with a schedule of deduction. A lot of us default here, uh, but uh, the pain is sometimes even the law, even the people that comes to check does not check very well. But the law is that deduct and pay where the person resides. And the law on where you reside, the, the law of residency shows that where you reside on the first day of January. If, for instance, I lived and worked in Enugu on the first of January in 2024, my tax will be paid to the Enugu state government. My pay will be deducted and paid to the Enugu state government. If by chance I have to relocate from Enugu, let's say June, the law still believes that. I am still in a new. So if my tax is deducted, let's say I'm working in an in, in evil state and they deduct my tax here, by law, we're supposed to send that deduction to the Enable State Government. You can only start paying my tax to the Enable State Government in January of the following year, taking that I'm still residing here. So that's what this law has. And then these are places where the the tax authorities will want to sit down and look at loopholes so that they will find us wanting and ask that charging us penalties. So income tax on passive income and capital gain tax are also referred to the State Board of Internal Revenue. I've mentioned this before, but it's important that we we'll see it again. Where an NGO engaged in any trade or business, the profit derived is subjected to income tax. I've also mentioned this before. Why NGOs are exempt from paying tax on income derived from their primary registered activities, such as foreign or domestic grants, subscription, membership, dues, donations, gifts, endowments, etc. They are liable for income tax on their commercial activities, such as business or trade. Because very often you will people, people will, you will hear people say NGOs are registered not to make not as profit oriented organizations but if at any point you have to deviate a little bit to do a trade or a business where you make profit please 
pay your tax. That is what the law is saying. And if you don't and if it's discovered, you will be fined. NGOs must also pay income tax on passive income. Not. Investment income, capital gain tax, if they dispose of their assets at any point, at a profit rather. If you dispose of your asset at a profit, you will have to work that profit and pay. And then NGO pays VAT on goods and services consumed, except those purchased exclusively for donor funded humanitarian projects or activities. So if you purchase those goods in SSDU, for instance, decide to purchase goods to go and supply or, 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 or deliver to a group of people for humanitarian purposes, let's say they have crisis or one thing or the other, yeah, such will not supposed to be charged. You don't supposed to pay tax of that, that on such issues. But where the case is otherwise, then you must pay your tax. And that's, this is uh, that act of the tax is governed by the value of the tax is amended. So compliance on withholding tax. I needed to bring back these slides again because of the importance and then the, the emphasis the federal government laid on this during the recent publication of the law of, of, the, of the amendment on withholding tax in Nigeria. The regulation requires a person making a tax deduction from any payment to issue a tax receipt to the supplier receipt, uh, or recipient for the amount withheld upon remittance of tax. We may not have been doing this, but this is the new position of the law. So we will have to go and print or develop receipts so that by the time you deduct withholding tax from a person, a supplier or a contractor, you will have to issue that person a receipt. This is the new law. This law is effective from 1st of July, 2024. Such a receipt is required to contain details about the recipients of supplies, including name, address, thing, very important, thing, that is task identification number, nature of the transaction, gross amount, amount deducted, and payment amount. So your receipt, the receipt you are going to print, you will design it to cover all these variables from the, the, the recipient. So, or the supplier. So by the time you are issuing this receipt, you will have to write out all this and then issue that receipt. Of course, we should know that we are going to keep a duplicate so that the days that complaints will come, we we'll also tend our own duplicate. So this is a new requirement, and this is a requirement we have to keep. The RATA will grant the supplier to so recipient credit following the presentation of the receipt. That is to say, when the, your supplier present this, present the receipt that you issued him or her or the contractor to the relevant tax authority, then we grant or issue the person a credit note. This is in respect of whether or not the person who made the deduction has remitted the amount of tax withheld to the relevant tax authority. Whether you have remitted that amount of money that you deducted or not, once the person presented that receipt that you give or you issue, they will issue the person the credit. Issue that supply, the COVID supply goes for it. The government will watch out for you to, 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 to remit that money or not, then they will come after you. So these are new reforms that we have to take serious. The unremitted amount shall be treated as tax liability of the person who made a deduction, the amount shall be recover, recoverable from the person with applicable penalty and interest. So when you don't remit, the government will look out for you at the proper time, and then you will not pay penalty and interest. Recall that we had mentioned earlier that when you deduct this money, you pay it 21 days into the new month for federal inland revenue, or 30 days into the new month for state internal revenue. So take note. By the time you do this and you don't remit, the law will come after you. So there are a few implications here. This could be there could be more. But I just like to bring out a few implications 
not complying to tax laws here. Then the first year is failure to deduct tax or to remit the deducted tax continues to attract penalties, interest, and stipulated relevant tax status. I recall when they come for this, all states have their own, though they are guided by joint tax board, but some of them had amendment. So you see that their interest uh, penalties may differ. Some of them are heavy. So when they come, when they come down with you, it's not very funny. I recall uh, working with characters in Nigeria to point when tax audit was done, and in one of our states, we had penalties and interest that went up to 50, 50, 54 million. And it was in a short space of time. And that was the state's own charge. So it became worrisome. And this is what would have been avoided if only the right remittance were done. So we will not allow ourselves to fall into this net. And I'm sure that's why SSDO have put up this, has packaged this presentation, a webinar for us, so that we should learn and then get out of this net. Where a person with an uh, where a person with an application to deduct fails to deduct a pays a portion representing deduction to the recipient. That's making payment in full to the recipient. That person will be liable to an administrative penalty. And the one of annual interest, the amount not deducted. So this is also a form of sharp, sharp practice that the law tries to guide us about. In case regarding the supply of goods, renting of services, or any eligible transaction involving non passive income, the amount to be deducted as source shall be twice the standard withholding tax rate if the recipient does not have a team. Okay, so in case regarding the supply of goods, rendering services, or eligible transaction involving non passive income, so when you have a uh, passive income, a non-passive income, and then you are failed to deduct and remit. The law is saying that by the time they come after you, you will have to pay two times this. And then the, the law is that uh, uh, the recipient, except the recipient does not have a thing. But when he has a thing, then you will charge this. So you can suffer temporary or total shutdown of activities based on the magnitude of your offense. So these are the challenges. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. So I think I have to stop at this end. Thank you. Um, over. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for the presentation. Uh, Grace, that was really insightful. Thank you so much, sir. You took us through key tax regulations as regarding Nigeria, tax regulations and compliance. Thank you, Mr. Justin, for that and wonderful and insightful presentation. Quickly, very quickly, we'll move on to the to our second speaker. Our spe second speaker is um, um, Duamaka Okoye, of course, our very own um, SSU's finance manager. She'll be taking us through the second, um, through the second, through the second section. So let me, let me let me briefly introduce Amaka. So those of us who are not familiar with her will probably have an idea of who she is. So Amaka is a seasoned chartered accountant with over 10 years plus experience in finance, accounting, and internal control. She has been our finance coordinator here in South Sudan since in 2016, where she oversees them um, finance and administration duties and oversees them um, finance and administrative functions of the of the organization. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, I present you Duamaka Okoye to run us through the second um, section where she'll be going through best practices in tax audit management and compliance strategies. All right, so um, um, Amaka, over to you. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, Good morning. I hope everyone can hear me. Yes, we can. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, can you as well let's see my screen, please? Yes, definitely. Yes, yes, we can see. Yes, and we are also getting responses from other people that they can see. Yes, familiar. Thank you. Yes. Okay, but I think your screen has just disappeared. Did you stop sharing? Okay. Yes, it's back up. 
it's back up now. Okay. Okay, thank you very yes. much. Um, right. So, um, and thank you, Teneke, for that uh, wonderful presentation. Um, he had done justice to the regulations around the tax and compliance for non-governmental organizations in Nigeria. So this session will cover the best practices when it comes to tax audit management and compliance. What happens when the tax authority comes to your office? You know, how do you go about that? How do you manage that to be sure that everything um, goes on smoothly? So the objective of this, our this thing is for us to understand the, um, the overview of managing tax audit effectively. And when we are able to understand this, it will help us to ensure compliance with tax authority. There is nothing like um, um, being certain when these people come around, there's this confidence that it gives you. Because one thing is that they don't give you notice that they're going to come next week or um, next month or whatever. You, you will least expect it when they will visit. And when they visit, you can't say no to them. So um, this session will help us to un understand how best we can handle this. And when we understand this session very well, it also will help us minimize risk and penalties. We all agree with me that in non-governmental organizations, our resources are limited, it's strengthened by the day. You know, imagine when you don't have enough funding to um, fund your interventions and all, and you are using the little resources that you have to um, pay government because of something that you know that could be avoided. Those things can be painful. And that is why we're having this session today to help us understand better how best we can go about this. And this will also, when we understand this session, it also help us in, enhance our reputation as an organization, right? Um, being a, a non-governmental organization, we write out proposal to donors at, at every interval to philanthropies for them to give us funding to do ABC. And they are always particular about how compliant we are whether there had been any penalties that we had paid, whether we have had any issue with the government in terms of this, that, you know, do not ask these questions and it is important to them. And when they learn that you have had one legal issue, litigation issue or the other with the government, it always does not speak well. Some of them will withdraw their intentions on giving you proceeding with their funding with your organization. So we are doing this um, so that we'll be more proactive in, in our actions and in action in tax management. Now, coming to understanding what tax audit is, is actually um, um, is an examination of organization tax reason by the tax authority. So when you talk about tax audits, you are talking about marrying the returns that you have done with the government with what the law says it's always what you did as against what the law says you know it's not the there's no any wishful thinking there it's about what you did your action versus what the law says so these are the basis um, of tax audits when it comes to tax audits so when anybody comes um, whatever they are doing is look at what the law says. How well were you able to apply this in your transactions, in your daily operations? That is basically what tax audit is. Then moving ahead to the types of audit. When we talk of audit, we have more than one of it. You know, um, sometimes when you do, um, um, Seneca had mentioned that we're supposed to be doing our annual filing with the tax authority at the end of every year, you know? So when you do that filing, it is the tax authority that will now look at your books. They will do their own assessment before they now finally accept it. And it, it becomes an approved um, filed document, right? So in the process of doing that, they may send you an email at interval and ask you one or two questions 
asking for additional support documents. That is what is called mail audit, right? Um, then there's another type of audit that is tax audit. It involves the tax authority conducting a review of their self-assessment that you did because the assessment you did that you filed is you that use your hand to assess yourself based on what you think that the law said, you know? So the tax authority is now looking at that self-assessment that you did as against how complete and correct it is when it comes to um, what the law says. You know, they may not be physically present at your office. They may be at their office to do this and, uh, and uh, give you a feedback. That is text audit. Then there is field audit. That one is comprehensive, more comprehensive than the desk. You know, uh, it's comprehensive and detailed where the Internal Revenue Service Audit Unit, you know, is conducted at the taxpayer's uh, location. They meet at, the, at your location to look at your document. So this one, there's a physical visit. The tax authority moves from their place to come to your place. They want to now look at with their own eyes what you say that you did. They want to see things for themselves. Then there's a limited audit. That one is kind of specific to an area. Let's say, um, because when, when you talk of tax audit, it's encompassing, it's beyond just payee remittance. You know? So when we talk of limited audit, you can refer to it as um, um, being focused in a particular area. Maybe they are looking at uh, having a holistic view on your payee remittance when it, for a particular period, maybe from 2021 to 2023, you know, they're not looking at any other aspect, just that PE. They are trying to find out how compliant you are when it comes to what the law says in PE remittance and filing. That is limited audit. Then there is this comprehensive audit. This one is, 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 is stressful, you know, to both parties and everything. Um, is a thorough examination of all aspects of the tax return. So when the um, state internal revenue service comes for a comprehensive audit, it's actually very, is a rigorous process in the sense that they are looking beyond what um, the, your payee filing, your annual payee filing, they're looking at your utility taxes, remittances, your pension, remittance, whether you are remitting, because one thing is to deduct, another thing is to, is to actually pay these things. Then um, um, you talk of the, for Enugu here, you talk of the land use charge. There are other little, little compliances that you need to do as far as you are a company, you are in operation, right? So there are some of the dues that you are meant to pay. So when they come for comprehensive audit, they are looking at everything that has to do with state, you know, whether you complied with everything, not just the tax. Then moving ahead um, to preparation for tax audits. Um, this is where the main thing is, right? Uh, because if you don't prepare so for something, there is no how you are going to come out best from it. So um, preparing for tax audit is actually, uh, should be a proactive um, action that we need to take. It's not something we need to do in retrospect. You know, this is where um, as an organization, your internal processes helps to make this place more seamless, right? You know, one thing is as, as an organization is ideal that you have internal processes and procedures in place that guides everything that you do, right? It does, it's not just uh, what anybody wishes to do that they do. They do things because this is in line with what this organization's policy says. You know, that is very key when it comes to preparation because that is what sets the tone internally for everybody that is involved, for every party that is involved, for the day-to-day -day running of the organization. Now, preparing for tax audits, there are two key major areas, which is gathering of the documents and reviewing of records. Now, in gathering the documents, this is where you have, um, you don't, 
um, tell the tax authority that you did this with your mouth, right? Where it's, it's about your documentation. If you don't have evidence that you did A, B, C, you are on your own when it comes to these things, when they come to visit you. You don't use your mouth to say, you were told to do this, you told this vendor this and that. Where is this documented? That is always the question. And when it's not documented, it's not done, right? So um, it is important that as an organization, we have a strong system in place that will help us to um, have proper document, not just document, documenting this thing, have them organized and easily accessible. I remember um, we had um, these tax auditors, they came around the office this year, you know, and they, they, they went back as far back as 20, 2017 to do their review, to do their audit. Imagine if we don't have um, filing system in place that made this document accessible. You see, you, we, you can see yourself paying for something you have already paid before because you cannot assess it. So this is where your internal processes play a key role. How do we document our transactions? How do we file them? So that even in the next five years, if we want to locate payment voucher B, C, is something that will be easy. So this, these are the questions organizations need to answer, you know, and put them in place to help. You know, not just um, fi finding this document, but when somebody that is in charge leaves, that succession plan, you know, you don't just tell the tax authority that the person that was handling this thing had left the organization. As a result, you don't know where the receipts, the schedules and the payment vouchers were. They will not listen to you. They won't. They will, <laughs> because they always find, you know, they, they are more happy when they see a loophole where they can get more money because for them, they are doing a better work because when they report back to their office, you know, they gathered more money for the government and all that. So once they see all those loopholes, they capitalize on it and, uh, and you have to pay the penalties that it attracts in line with the law. So um, it's important that we look into these things seriously. It's something, like I said, we need to be proactive about because when these things happen, you can't go back to the transaction you have done in 20, 18, for example, and, and say you want to start documenting them at that time. It's, it's actually a difficult thing to do. So plan ahead, have this system in place so that every staff in the organization will know that if I need money, this is what I need to do. The people in the finance will know if we're paying to a vendor, we're told in taxes we need to apply once this requirement and that requirement are met, you know? And you do this thing. And also very important that is remitted. That is the, because it's, it's even more um, difficult when you deduct and you don't remit. It's a, it's more, it's a grievous offense. You know, it's, it's, it's one thing that you, you, you did not deduct at all and you did not remit. It's even more grievous if you deduct a tax and you don't remit it. They, they frown at it very, very well. Right. So, um, so in preparation of the tax audit is is when when you get um, the, the stages. Hello, are hello. Actually, sorry, Amaka. Yeah. Sorry, Amaka. Are, are you are you are you sharing your are you are you yeah I can hear are you moving your slides? No, 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 no. Okay, okay. I am not. Right, okay. Oh, okay. Is it okay. moving? I was just trying to check. No, no, no. I was just double checking because some people thought you are moving your slides already. No, I'm not. But is it oh, clear now? No. Can they see it? Yes, yes, it's, it's clear. It's, it's visible. Okay. All right. So as I was saying, um, preparation for tax audit is um, the key. This thing is the gathering of the documentation. And as you are gathering the document, you are making sure that they are in line with what the law said, right? Um, I also needed to point out here that you should have a minimum time you need to keep your document in your office. Because I just mentioned um, these people came and went back as far back as 2017. Um, you, we wouldn't have told them that these documents are not available, right? 
because it's, it's a long time ago, something like that, you know. In line with the law, I think, I think documents are meant to stay for at least seven years before you think of uh, disposing them. That is, that is uh, what the law says, at least for seven years. So um, we, we need to make sure that we have archive where we keep those things in case anything comes off tomorrow so that we can easily go there and get these things. So we sort out the vouchers, the schedules, and the documents. Then you do the review because it's also important you review your document before you give them to the tax authority. It's not good that um, you just gather them, you know, this is the payment voucher and all. You need to review them. You, you ensure that these things are in line with what it should be. If there are errors, this is the time you need to correct it. You don't correct error in front of the um, auditors and all that, you know, that shows that you are prepared. And this is the stage you need to do these things. You have your checklist, you check all the things, you have your schedule, the receipts that you use in paying to the um, state revenue service and all those, they are together, they are ready, right? So um, that is that in, in preparation of the tax audit. Moving forward to engaging with the tax authority now. When we talk of engaging with the tax authority, we um, there are two key things, which is communication and uh, professional assistance. So these people, um, you know, we, they are they are stakeholders in as much as we, we are their stakeholders too. We are kind of partners, you know, um, together because um, they need us in as much as we need them as well. So when they come, um, communication is key when they come. Don't see them as um, police officers in quotes that are coming to find error or who they will collect their money, you know? If you, if you have a kind of interface, it will make your response to be aggressive. And, uh, you know, you may not be composed enough to face whatever questions that may come out of it. So when they come around, just see them as, you know, you are together. You are seeing them as, okay, we are here. Whatever question you have, bring it on. We will face it. You will calmly explain to them why ABC is the way it is, you know? Because one thing is for you to also know what the law says. When they tell you, look at what the law said, you also know whether that thing they're saying is actually true or not. Because it's true that uh, um, anybody can make mistake. Them that, that are the tax auditors can also sometimes misquote some of these laws, right? And if you if you are not very conversant with it, you flow with them that way. But when there's a mistake from either parties, anybody can correct each other, you know, and uh, find a common ground in these things. So it's, it's, it's a period of maintaining open and transparent communication with them. If they ask for additional documents, don't refuse them, you know, in as much as is in line with the documents you are going to give them. You go ahead, provide those documents. They ask for more information, you give them, you know, and it will make the whole process to be seamless. Another important thing is it's good to have one person in charge of um, and tax when it comes to compliance with the with the government. Why is that? Because um, Mr. A may be responsible for the tax authority, right? In, in, in ensuring that everything is complied with and all. And uh, maybe in the next year, another person is responsible. There's this um breaking communication the person may not know where this one stops you know and where what needs to be continued so it's always good that somebody is assigned to be responsible for relating with the tax authority anything that has to do with compliance is this person the person sees to it even when they come to the office the person will be the one to um you know represent the organization if there is no need to ask for that question to other staff members, 
you know, they can be beckoned on to come and all those things. But it's always good to have one person because that person will know the conversation he or she had had with them before now so that there will be that continuity. That is also important. Then at this stage too, there are some, um, at some point that you may feel that you don't have the capacity in-house to face the tax authority because some people, once they hear that these people are coming, they start fidgeting, you know, and all. If you feel that you're, you, you don't have um, um, the capacity in-house, you can as well outsource this, uh, this thing to um, professionals and consultants which can help you do this thing seamlessly, you know, you for a token so that uh, all these things is for you to avoid um, the things that we mentioned in our first slide, your reputation, penalties, you know, and for you to be compliant. You know, as a non-governmental organization, that should be our key word because we're, we're, in the, we're in the middle of the government and the people. And we can't be doing that when we know that we are not in line with the law. Yeah. So that is it. So the key areas of compliance I mentioned um, that we need to be proactive about is the financial aspect, right? Um, when it comes to the payment of your um, payment vouchers, you know, how do you keep the records? How do you have the processes? How these things are approved? You know, to ensure that every payment that are supposed to, um, that taxes are supposed to be applied are applied. Are there system in place to be sure that it's not just uh, every payment it goes, you know, without all those checkings and all. Because once these things are not checked, you know, you don't pay these taxes as and when due, it will definitely gonna affect you when these people come because you won't have any evidence to present. So in this financial aspect, this is where you have that um, system in place to be sure that all the transactions are processed, goes through the distance, um, through the processes to identify whether they met a particular criteria before the funds are finally paid. So um, this is um, where the organization needs to look at to have that system set up. Is it the finance that will be doing this? Who checks the document? Is it a program? And all those, um, uh, it's always good to have a compliance person, you know, an internal auditor assigned to this role so that the person will look through this thing and be sure that all the processes are followed before it goes to finance for final payment. Now in the operational part is where the organization focuses on following the internal policies and procedures of the organization. This is very important um, because this is what makes an organization to sustain itself. Because when processes are not followed, anybody does anything the way they feel, how they want it, you know, nothing checkmates them and all those things. So it's, it's important that the policies that we have in our organization are followed because that is what makes this thing easier, you know, um, to have these things in place. Then ensuring that the legal these things are followed as well. Um, the legal, this thing that you need to um, see that all transactions are followed like where the withholding taxes are supposed to be applied. Was it applied before those payments are finally made? Our, our staff, the payees, are they deducted? The pensions, are they deducted? You know, the health insurance, national health insurance fund, are they deducted? And all those things before the salaries of the staff are, are, are paid. And when they are paid, when they are deducted, sorry, are they remitted to the relevant tax authority? Because um, it baffles me that some organizations deduct these things from staff, but they don't pay to the tax authority. 
one day will come, you know, you won't have any evidence to provide, you know. So these are the key areas we need to focus on. Then going ahead, I need to share our experience um, as an organization. I mentioned earlier, we had a tax audit here this year, you know. That was around January this year, and we were just normal day doing our thing, and we saw a dispatch writer came in and then um, brought a letter, which was from the State Internal Revenue Service about the audit notification. Well, we looked at the letter, we felt mm, maybe they will not come, and all those things. They gave us a date and said if the date is not convenient, we should write back and give a, a, a new date and all those things. We saw it and then we kept it. We, we thought it's something that will, you know, they will forget with time. Um, I think a uh, few weeks later, I think two weeks after, um, they wrote back, they have not gotten any feedback. That was when we knew that it was a serious uh, this thing. So we wrote back to them and gave them a date. Um, they need to come. And, uh, and that date they came, you know. So when, when we gave them the date, we used that period to gather because they gave us the period um, they were going to review was 2017 to 2022 because there was a new uh, change in government. You know, the new government, you know, as a new administration, we're trying to make some few changes here and there. So we gave them a date. Of course, uh, we looked internally. We have been doing our distance. So the distance will be to gather this document. And we brought out time. We gathered this document from 2017 to 2022. And they came to our office. You know, we brought out the vouchers, the schedules and the receipts and all other remittances because it was a comprehensive audit they came to do, not just the payee aspect. So, but um, during the distinct key, there are two key areas that um, was a major distinct for us, right? There was a major issue. Now, um, in 2017, we, we did our annual filing. Yeah, few days after 31st of January. Seneca had mentioned all your payee remittances. You are supposed to file them on or before 31st of the following year. That is what the law said. If you fail to do that, you know, you, you are going to be penalized. So for 2017, we did, we did file, but it was a uh, first week of February. Reason being that the back and forth, you know, during the assessment with the state revenue service, there was this back and forth. And anytime there is a, when they reject your this thing, you have to rewrite with the new data and all. And the day they actually acknowledged our filing was that first week of February, you know, and they termed it that we did a late filing. Considering the fact that our letter, the date was in, in, in January 20 something. That was that one issue um, that they brought out. Then another key issue was in 2019, because normally we do our hard copy filing, we document, you know, our distance with the letters and all, and send it to the state internal revenue service, you know, and they acknowledge we come back with file. And um, in 2019, we received an email from from the state internal revenue service that they have moved to e-filing. Mm -hmm. They gave us a username and password where we are to do our filing. And wow, we're like interesting, you know? So that year, 2019, we did not bother ourselves going to the um, internal revenue to do the hard copy. We just logged in, we saw the distance, we did our upload and yeah, we did our filing and we are good. And everything was moving on well um, until in one of the months we went there to get, um, one of us, um, my colleague went to get um, a receipt of one of the pages that were paid, you know, because they know they know us. Uh, one of them said, oh, we didn't see you people's uh, filing um, for last year. What happened? 
the person mentioned, ah, we, we did online. You guys said that we can do online. So, but no, 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 you were supposed to also 